Well, hysteria was diagnosed by uh, Hippocrates, as I mentioned, that's 4, 450 BC, so that's really quite a long time. It didn't really go out of fashion as a diagnosis. Well, it was legislated out of existence in 1957 uh, by the American, I think it's American Psychiatric Association. Um, but it, there's still a catch-all category for things. Uh, Charles Lassaguet, who was a 19th century French physician, once said that hysteria was the, the waste paper basket of otherwise unemployed medical symptoms. And into this waste paper basket went all sorts of things from antiquity until, well, until Freud's time. And he then he put a new interpretation on what hysteria was. Uh, and that's the one that we kind of we remember most, most often. Um, but the, the disease, that, the quote disease, uh, that is described by um, Hippocrates and by Thomas Sydenham, who's a, uh, I'm trying to remember, 17th century? Uh, he's the, called the English Hippocrates. He's a historical British physician. Uh, it really sounds a lot more like sexual frustration. She, uh, she's nervous. She's, uh, she has trouble sleeping. She has trouble with anxiety. She has these vague feelings of uh, heaviness in the abdomen. Uh, and then my two favorite symptoms, you don't see this in every, every uh, description, but you see them in enough to make you suspicious. Uh, one of the symptoms is sexual fantasy, and the other is vaginal lubrication. And if these are symptoms, there are an awful lot of sick people out there, right? And they found a lot of sick people. They, they thought in the 19th century, for example, that three quarters of all women, middle, middle class women, uh, suffered from hysteria. And, and if those are the symptoms, maybe they did. In some cases, it was innocence. But in, uh, I wasn't even sure of the, my hypothesis myself until I saw uh, the works of a, of a fellow named Nathaniel Highmore who wrote about hysteria in 1666. And he wrote, he wrote in Latin, so it's a very good thing I took that, you know, did all that classics back in, as an undergrad. Um, that he said, uh, he just calls what he's producing. He tells you all about how to do it. Well, you know, here you get some oil, you know, and you get all, you know, greased up, and then you, you know, the fingers of this hand go in here, and the fingers of the other hand go here, and, and then she'll get to breathe hard, and then there'll be uh, contractions, and she'll get all red in the face, you know. And, he, and then he just goes right on and says, well, it's an orgasm, you know. But it's your job to do this because you're a doctor. Right, and you have to relieve the symptoms, and she will feel better for a while, and she'll be back, you know, if she can afford to come to the doctor regularly. So it was, a, it was a great way for a doctor to make a living. You know, these women are not really sick, and they're not going to get well either. So you know, uh, it was it, that was one of the things you notice about the, in the 19th century. The doctors actually write about that; that it's a good source of revenue. Um, but some of the doctors actually in the in the um, in the the in the 17th century, and that is in Highmore's time, in Britain, uh, Audrey Eccles, who's a British historian of medicine, has documented that there was actually a, uh, a split between Protestant and Catholic doctors about whether it was really um, uh, appropriate for doctors to be doing this, because they knew what was going on at that time they did. It's not clear if they did it in the 19th century or not. Um, but apparently the, the, the Catholic doctor said, well, it's your duty to do this. So, you know, she might, my, she might die of it, you know, or, <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, so you have to do this. And the Protestant doctors were like, oh, oh, we mustn't, you know, terrible thing, you know. Um, but apparently that, you know, it was, that all was gone by the 19th century and the doctors were, most of them were saying, oh, it's nothing sexual. It can't be anything sexual because there's no penetration and therefore no sex, right? It can't be. It has to be something else. Hysterical paroxysm, that's what we're seeing. It's like the breaking of a fever when you have a cold, you know, and you, you get all, you're all feverish for a while and then the fever breaks and you feel better. Yeah, see, that's it. The crisis of the disease, very Galenic. Uh, so they had their complete explanation there. But some of them even then knew, uh, one of them who did was a fellow, named, a French physician, that would be a French physician, right? Uh, Auguste Tripier, uh, and he says in, I think it's 1883, he says, look, guys, and he does mean guys because he's speaking to an audience of, of uh, physicians and they're all guys, uh, look, you know, you know as well as I do that this is une crise venérienne. This is a, an orgasm, a, 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 a sexual crisis. 
uh, but it, we're doing it anyway. It's just as if we're masturbating these patients. And they were like, we don't want to hear it, accused. You know, and they just, they, they just ignored it, went right on. The only thing that stopped them, I think what stopped them, there are two things. One of them is, uh, well, actually three. Um, F Freud comes along and he, uh, he, he attempts massage therapy for hysteria and it turns out that he doesn't, he's never good at it. Uh, this is the guy who didn't know what women wanted, right? So he, he decided he'd sit him up and talk to them instead. And, uh, and he, that, we can go on from there. But in any case, that's one thing that happened is Freud comes along and reinterprets hysteria, what it is. Oh, it's lesions in the consciousness. You know, it's not, nothing to do with sex. You know. uh, the second thing that comes along is there begins to be a little more knowledge about women and their sexuality. Not a whole lot, but there are some early sexology uh, that uh, that is very persuasive um, and people begin to say well you know maybe women do have sexuality maybe it's not unhealthy you know uh, and then the third thing that happens and this is this is the real killer as it were uh, the vibrator begins to appear in pornography and then the doctors go ah! and just drop it like a hot rock you know they don't want anything more to do with it because you know you, it's obvious that what they're doing is exactly what these women are doing to themselves in these, like, you know what a cabinet card is. It's about like this, and that's sort of a 19th century, early 20th century. Um, you could buy them for respectable things like a, a theater, theater star. So you could get a picture of, like, you know, who the, whoever the famous stars were. And, and you could get, like, really weird ones, and you could get ones of disasters. But you could also get pornographic ones, and there were these images of women with uh, with vibrators. And then by the 20s, we have uh, the vibrator being used in films. Um, and of course, like uh, I have a I have a colleague, uh, and I'm always I'm always plugging his work, Jonathan uh, Coopersmith. He's at uh, Texas A&M. He's written a wonderful article called Pornography at Progress. And he he uh, makes the point that the, all these technologies like cabinet cards, the telephone, fax machine, um, video, the internet, uh, all the, the sexuality has seized on these things and turned them to its own purposes, thereby providing a stream of capital into the development of these technologies. And so you and I can sit here talking to each other through a video screen, uh, and a lot of the capital for the development of the technology was funded by that good old standby human sexuality.